We're gonna cover GitHub forks, how to create Git branches, why you should make your changes in a Git branch, also how to add remotes to your forked clone. Wow, that sounds scary. Lots of scary terms in there. Don't worry, you're not the only one who thinks that. I still think it's scary now after 15 years. But we are gonna go through those, what they mean, how to use them, and how you can make your life easier, and how you can look like a pro when working on your project for open source, or for your job, or for a client. If that sounds interesting to you, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, and while you're down there, subscribe to my YouTube channel for lots of open source green squares, and watch till the end for good luck. When you find a project that you want to contribute to, the first thing you want to do is fork it. That way you take a copy of the project into your own account because you don't have permission to write this project. Yes, you can raise issues on this project and raise pull requests. We'll cover those in a moment. But if you want to make changes, you need to fork it. So what I would suggest to do is click the fork button. It will take you to the next page and GitHub will lead you through it. So I want to fork it, take a copy of it into my GitHub account and I want to create fork. So now that is working, the cogs and the little mice in GitHub are doing their work to copy of that into my own account where I have permissions. So this would be the project that I want to clone. So make sure you don't clone the original project, clone your forked version. That's, that's step number one. So if I want to make changes to this locally, yes, I can use GitHub UI. You see me do that all the time in my live streams and other videos. But in this video, we're going to use the CLI. So now I want to clone this project. So you can choose HTTPS, SSA, GitHub, CLI, whatever works for you and use whatever tool you want. But like I said, this video we're focusing on the CLI. So I'm going to copy SSH, that's what I use and then what I recommend. Navigate to the directory where you want it to appear on your computer. So I put mine in downloads, repos. And then I'm going to do a git clone and I'm going to paste in the URL that I just copied from the GitHub website. And if I just hit enter now, it will create a folder of this project called Linkfree. If you wish to call it something else because you want to remember what it's called, for example, if you want to prepend it with the organization or the user, you can add an extra variable at the end, which in this case would be EddieHub. I might call it EddieHub Link Free, and you can do something like that. But I'm happy with the default name, so I'm just going to hit enter and it's going to clone it. It's going to ask me for my password because I'm using SSH and I have my keys protected with a password. So now it's cloned. Don't forget to navigate into the project so I can navigate into the Link Free project and I've got that. So I'm in that directory and I'll have, if I list the files, you'll see I'll have the same files as what's listed in here. Maybe in a different order, but they will be listed in there as well. The numbers might look a bit different, but on the CLI, when you list the files, it doesn't show the hidden ones by default, whereas GitHub is. So if I just clear that and I say uh, list format, which is the minus L, but then also A to say all, you can see now that looks a lot more familiar. So what I want to show you next is our clone of the repo is looking at our fork, which is great, which is what we want. So if I do git remote v, it will say origin. So my local git repo is looking at my forked version. You can see that it's looking at EddieJild link free rather than EddieHub link free, which is what the original project is. And if you go to the top of GitHub, you can see this is the original project, also known as upstream. So I want to use the correct terminology for you. So with this cloned git repo, we can push and pull to our forked version. And that's great, that's good for step, kind of the next step and maybe a step afterwards. But soon we're gonna want to be able to do more than that, interact with the original, the upstream project. So let's do this in order, let's make a change first. Now I'm gonna open VS Code to make the change. I'm gonna make a straightforward change to the readme. In the readme I noticed there's something that's inconsistent. If you look here at some of the examples of data file, this has my name and it has Koalia's name, but for Naomi, it has their GitHub username. So I want it to be consistent. So let's make that consistent. Naomi Carrigan. So now I've hit save. And so I have got changes in my project locally. So I do a status minus S, which is a command I'd like to use to check for changes. I can see that that readme file has changed. Correct. I can do, always do a diff and look at the changes and it shows me the, what has been removed and what has been added. Again, looks correct, I'm happy with that. We need to do a commit next. So next we can do git commit, but ah, don't do a commit just yet. Really, before you change so you don't forget, always create a branch. And you can do that with git checkout minus b in the branch name. And I highly recommend using the issue number as a branch if you have one. If you haven't, you could just give it a little bit of a description. 
quite short and concise. And you can also use patch. When you're changing things on the GitHub UI, it does default to use patch. So I'm just gonna say patch one. Not very descriptive, but you get the idea for this video. So now I've switched to the patch one branch. You can see before we were in main, and now we're in patch one. And nothing has changed. If I list the files, it will be exactly the same as what we saw. So as we before, when we did a fork, which took a copy of the project into our account, a branch is similar wherever we are in the repo. When we do a branch, it takes a copy of the source files into that branch. So it's kind of very similar, but for two different reasons. So that's exactly the same. And if I do a status, you will see again, it's exactly the same. But we're in patch one branch now. So now we can do our commit. And it's really important to make your change is in a branch, always in a branch. If it's your repo, it's probably less important, but I still highly recommend it. But if it's in a forked repo, you must do it in a branch. And you may be thinking, Eddie, I've contributed to loads of projects and I've done it in the default branch, which is usually main and it's been fine. On your first contribution, it will be fine. It's on your second or third contribution when you start getting conflicts and you'll be conflicting with yourself and it'll be really weird to so avoid that. Make it easier for yourself. Don't give yourself extra work. So we're in a branch. Let's do a commit now. And there's a couple of ways you could do the commit. You could stage the files, or you could specify the files on the commit command. So here I've got one file that's changed to readme.md, so I could do dot. Dot is very dangerous, so I wouldn't recommend using it. I could specify readme and then come back to my description to add the description. I always put the files first before the description. I don't know why. But another way you could do it, if you had multiple files, you could actually stage the files. You could do it in two steps. So I didn't commit that just yet, so if I do a status, it's still there but I could actually do git add and specify the files I want to add. And now if I do a status, you'll see on the line above, it is with an M saying modified, but on the kind of the second character column. Whereas now I've added it, if I do a status, it's green and on the, the left column, so on the first column. And the reason for that is it means that it's staged. If I had multiple files that are changes, I could stage certain files. And stage means ready to be commit. If I go back to the commit again now, I don't have to specify the files at the end. I could actually just go and directly put in my message. And this will automatically commit the files that have been staged, the ones that have a green and on the first column if you do a git status minus s. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, leave your ideas, thoughts, comments below. But let's uh, keep continuing and pushing forwards and hopefully it makes more sense soon. So that's the way to do it staged. So what we can do is write a git uh, commit message now as descriptive as we can. I think this was a docs related. I'm using conventional commit messages here. If you want to learn more about that, you can look at some of my other videos. I do have videos on this. So in this case, I will do consistent profile example examples and s and hit enter and now it says it has changed one file so do a git status minus s you can see there are no other changes so this is in my forked version locally on my computer in a branch so how do we get this to the original repo well the next thing we do is push it to github so what we can do is we can push it to my fork which is origin so we can say git push origin and then we'll push it to the same branch name on github which is patch one so I type in my password, you might not be asked for your password depending on your setup. So now that has pushed, if I go back to GitHub and you can see it says seven branches, if I refresh this page, it should say eight. And now we have the branch that we just pushed up, but it's still in my fork. Um, people can see it if they come to my account, but they can't see it on the original repo and we wanna make a pull request. So therefore the um, authors or the maintainers of the other original project can review it and accept it in. We're gonna come back to why it's important to do it in a branch. So really do watch till the end, not just to help the algorithm and my stats. There is a reason. I wanna try and save you lots of time and effort and struggles fighting with Git. Git's our friend and uh, don't let it work against it. Be nice to Git and Git will be nice to us. So what we can do next is go back to the original project and we can go to the pull request section. And by default, it looks at the branches within the project. However, very hidden up here, I don't really usually notice this before, so maybe you did, you can compare across forks. So if we click that now, we actually get an extra dropdown for each branch, which is the repo. So the destination is gonna still be EddieHub community link free, and the base is gonna be main branch, and the actual pull request is gonna come from my account. So it's gonna be EddieJowd link free, but it's not gonna be main, as you'll see, 
there are no changes, there are no differences in these branches. But we will select our branch, which we called patch one. And now there are differences, and it gives us a preview of what those differences are. It shows us the lines that have changed, and actually even the characters as well. So I'm happy with that. So I'm going to create the pull request, and now it's gonna allow me to write a title, add a screenshot, close an issue, all that great stuff. Make sure you look at these um, templates and fill it in properly for this situation. I'm gonna keep it straightforward. I want you to focus on the git CLI commands. So I'm gonna hit create. Now it's created the pull request and the checks are gonna run. And then people can review it and see the files that changed. That's great, that's gonna now wait until the maintainers or the community are ready to review that. So I wanna go back to our command line. And so what we've got here, let me just show you the remotes again. So what is our local git repo connected to? At the moment is connected to origin, which is our fork. And we can see that in this um, URL. But what I wanna do, I wanna connect the link-free project, the original upstream project, so therefore when changes come into the main branch on the original project, I can update my fork. So what I need to do is head back to the starting point of the repository and go to code. And just like when we forked the project before, we're gonna copy that repo URL, but instead of forking it, so now we need to add a remote of the original project. And it's recommended to use upstream, so we can go git remote add upstream. You can call this whatever you want, however I recommend following the standards. And this is where we paste in the URL. Let me make that a little bit wider. So now I can hit enter, and now I've added that. If I do git remote minus v again, you can see we have two paths. We have origin and we have upstream. So our local repo has kind of knowledge of how to push and pull and fetch from those destinations. We always want to push to origin in this case because we only have right access to push to our forked version of the repo. But when we pull or fetch the changes, we want to do that from the upstream. I am using uh, the words fetch and pull and they are different. Fetch means it's gonna get the changes but not bring it into your local working branches. You have to then merge it in as a second step and pull will do it all in one step. It will fetch and merge in one go. So just to recap, you want to always push to origin, but we want to fetch or pull from the upstream to pull down the latest changes. So there won't be any changes for us because I don't think any pull requests have been merged into the uh, original, the upstream project since we've been recording this video, my pull request or someone else's. But what you would do just to show you is we would say git fetch upstream and it will ask for my password. And now it will bring all the upstream branches. So now it will fetch all the branches available on the upstream uh, repository. So the next step we would need to do if there were changes would be git merge upstream and then we would say main. But we're not in the main branch yet, so I almost made a mistake. What we want to do is change back to the main branch whenever you fetch from the upstream repo. So now we're back in there. If we do a status, nothing has changed. If you'll notice the changes I made would not be in here as well because that's in the patch one branch. And that's why it's important not to do it in the main branch because my changes need to get into my forked version into the main branch via the upstream repo, not via me doing it locally on my computer. Because if they squash my pull request when they bring it in to the default branch on the original repo, because if I go to pull requests, and I will show you how uh, maintainers can merge this. This is by me, this is the one. On this repo, by default, squash and merge. That will rewrite the history. And so if I have written changes to on my forked version to the main branch, and then the maintainers rewrite history on when they merge it on the upstream repo, then the histories won't match and we'll get conflicts. So this is why it's really important to make sure you get that loop, okay? So just to clarify, you fork the repo, you make changes in a branch and you push to our fork and then we create a pull request from our fork to the upstream project. And then to get our changes, once it's been merged or any other changes from any other pull requests into our forked repository in the main branch, it must come via a fetch off the original repo, which is upstream. So we did the fetch already, uh, almost did the merge, but we didn't because we were in my temporary branch. So now we can do a git merge upstream main. And it says already up to date because it hasn't been merged in yet. But let me prove it to you. I know some of you are skeptical, so I'm gonna squash and merge this. I'm gonna break the rules. You never merge your own pull requests, but I'm gonna do this for now. I'm gonna squash and merge. 
and I'll delete the branch as well. So you won't have the ability to do that on the upstream repo. I can because it's on the Eddie Hub project. And I wanna show you the command line. So now if I do a fetch again, I've gone through my history, and if I do a git fetch upstream, I can ask for my password. It probably won't ask for yours depending on your setup but you will see now some changes have come down into the main branch. But if I look here in the log, it's still not my commit. We haven't merged it into my main branch, but it is available on my local machine. So next, if I go up to my history again and say git merge upstream main, it now says one file changed. And if I do a git log, you can see that is my description and that is my name and so forth as well. So now we've brought the changes into main. So I actually no longer need my patch branch. So I could say git branch delete patch one that we created before, because we actually don't need that anymore because I have my changes in the main branch. And so now if I want to do a second contribution, this is where I would create a new branch from the main branch. And if you do this wrong, as in you don't do your first change on a branch, this is where you start getting weird conflicts. And so I think it's really important to follow this process. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, let me know your questions in the comments below and we can talk about it. I know your questions will help me and other people understand this process because it is a bit scary the first time, but after you've done it three, four, or for me it was like 10 or 20 times, then you get used to the process. Don't forget to join our Discord, link in the description below. We can chat between videos and live stream. I'll see you in the next video.